are live now with Love at First Laugh. And I'm so excited today because I have a really good friend of mine. And he's also my writing partner, one of my writing partners. I adore him. He is the most talented and brilliant man I ever met. Uh, and I am so happy that he's here to talk about love and relationships and Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Forever Night. And he was also part of Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Please welcome my good friend, Barney Cohen. Yay. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm fine. I'm good. Growing my quarantine beard. How's it look? You look very sexy with that beard. Thank you very much. You I look usually very have a very close crop crop one, but I'm just letting it go. Yeah, who cares, right? Yeah. yeah what day I'm is it anyway? Too. Look at those roots. You look, you look marvelous. <laughs> I have to fluff up my thank hair you. a little bit. Thank you. I was totally fishing for a compliment, so thank you. You deliver, yeah. like always. <laughs> I'm always there. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so, uh, so, so you and I uh, do a lot of stuff. Yes, we do have stuff, but before we talk about our stuff, I would love for you to talk about Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Uh, what part did you have in that project? And also, any love stories behind that sitcom? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, this is my third career. I was on, um, I started on Madison Avenue as a creative director back in the Mad Men days. And then I was a journalist for the New York Times and went all around the world. And now I'm a filmmaker. And if you suspect I've had girlfriends along the way, you might think that, but I couldn't possibly confirm it. Uh, the truth <laughs> is, when I was a little kid, there was a um, there was a pop song called What is Love? And it went, what is love? Five feet of heaven in a ponytail. Uh, and the guys who are out there, if you're really old, you'll remember that song. And then uh, many years later, when I was in college, I met one of those five feet, ponytail, adorable. And four years later, I married her. Aww. And she's, and I'm, we're still married. So um, when we talk about uh, love and romance and lust, uh, con cuidado, you know. <laughs> but yeah, Sabrina. Yes, yeah, Sabrina. That's, the we'll, Sabrina we'll go thing, back to your marriage and all that. But I definitely, let's do Sabrina. There's a, there's, a, there's a lesson in love uh, buried in, in, in Sabrina. Uh, I think it's in, the, by the way, I, I didn't do very much on this series. I wrote and produced a Showtime movie with Melissa and Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds played the sexy boy. Um, when it came time to turn that movie into a series, Ryan said no, Melissa said yes, and I think they both made really good decisions. So most of what I did on that series was I invented it with the help of Archie Comics, which is the owner of Sabrina, and um, and cash checks for a really long time, so it was it was a great thing. But in the movie, um, the two different aunts, uh, Beth Broderick and Caroline Ray, came on to play Aunt Zelda and Aunt Hilda for the uh, for the series. But the movie was shot in Canada, and so the aunts were um, Canadian, as is Ryan Reynolds, because we had a almost complete Canadian cast. And somewhere in the in the in the in the third act, um, when uh, Melissa Sabrina is trying to uh, woo uh, Ryan Reynolds, um, she and she she realizes, oh, I've just become a witch. That's really cool. And uh, either 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 uh, Aunt Tilda or Aunt Zelda, I don't remember, uh, says to her, you know, you can't witch for love. And what she means is. Love is not something you can take. It's something that's given. Right. And that's a key lesson to learn for people who think, well, I'll become the captain of the football team and then they'll all want me, which is true. But those are the people that get divorced later. Same thing with right. the big business guy. Same thing with anybody who wants to take love rather than wait for it to be given to him. That's my lesson for the day. I love it. I love it. You don't look for it. You, it finds you and, and you find it, right? Yeah. You put yourself yeah. in the right place. You hang around with the right people. And by the right people, what I mean, I was writing a script with somebody else. By the way, I cheat on you from time to time and write screenplays oh, with other people. Me, by the way, whoever is watching, the people that are watching, he's one of my writing partners and he's cheating on me. I, this is the first time I hear about this. <laughs> so this, this is oh, a, some time ago. Now. 
I was writing a script with, uh, it was a, ro a rom-com, like I wrote with you. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, we got, she, we, we were trying to establish that these two people had fallen in love. And she kept wanting to run out a string of things. I love Johnny Mathis. Ooh, I love Johnny Mathis too. Or I like asparagus. Well, I all love asparagus. And her feeling about love, by the way, she's a single woman. Uh, her feeling about love was if you could tote up like 12 things that you're simpatico on, you're in love. And I kept saying, no, no, no. That's, wh that's when you become a friend. Love is a chemical thing. You know, the, the poets say, well, love is chemistry because they, they believe by saying it's chemistry, they mean it's, it's a fantasy thing. It, it, you can't, it's unknowable. But the truth is it probably is chemistry. It's probably something about your molecules and the other yeah. guy's molecules. I mean, well, I look back over the women that I thought, oh, my God, I could be in love with her if I let myself, which was a lot before my wife and not so much after my wife. But I look back, and they're completely different. The first woman that I was interested in, it was in the second grade. Her name was Joan. I had no idea what it was that was affecting me. I just knew that I had to punch Joan in the stomach. And, of course, that ended that relationship right away. And, and then I look back at all these women that have doubted me. They're all completely different. But there's something in the chemistry. Nobody has a type. Somebody has a, a sort of hard to, 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 to deduce complicated chemical type. And when it encounters another, it's almost like astrology except real. Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's what love is. Yeah. So, so, so you... So let's say that you have chemistry with someone, but then on paper, they're not the best choice, right? For, yeah. for you. So how do you handle that? That's, well, that's I think, a problem with a lot of people. Well, what Benjamin Disraeli said was, you marry your best friend and sleep with your mistress. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> what do you mean? That? I have to have two? One, like marry one guy and then have like a lover? That's like that's a, a No, Benjamin Disraeli said that. I'm just... No, no, that was Benjamin Disraeli in the 19th century, Prime Minister okay. of England. I'm just wow. retweeting it, okay? Okay, okay. But no, what, what, he, more time. <laughs> no, what he meant was something that, like, I was getting at. If you can find somebody where 12 important things to you, favorite movie, favorite food, favorite song, are similar, that's a friend. That's somebody yeah. you can enjoy a lot of stuff with. But there's another kind of person who there is some chemical thing that you just have to be together. It's like animal magnetism, yeah. another yeah. A poetry word. Uh, the, 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 the great marriages, I'm, I'm pinning a rose on my nose and saying my marriage is great, but the lasting marriages are ones that, um, that combine those two things. You know, there's that great, I think it's, I forget who's saying, who's saying we got married in a fever hotter than a pepper sprout. We've been talking about Jackson ever since the fire went out. I have no it's idea. It's a great country song. Great country song. We got married in a fever, hotter than a pepper sprout. We've been talking about Jackson ever since the fire went out. The, the key to finding somebody that would, for a lasting relationship yeah. is when the fire goes out, which it inevitably will do. Sometimes it comes back, sometimes it doesn't. But when the fire goes out, you still want to stay. Right. You still want to stay. Yeah. When the fire goes so you, out, because the fire is going to go out. But some couples, I hear some couples like the fire is always burning, but that's not the usual, the, the common I, thing, right? I, I, I'm about 112 years old. And I think if my fire was burning all this time, I'd have died at 50. Uh, at, at some point, you have to sort of relax back into your life and say, this is my friend yeah. for life. So if you can combine so, the two and start off on fire and end off, you know, that's great. So you end up being friends. So you have to have that friendship to begin with. Yeah. And chemistry, which is a very hard thing to find, you know, to have a friend and that you have chemistry with and that yeah. both feel the same way. Yeah, chemistry is the fire. It's a chemical it's the fire. fire. Yeah. And nobody knows, how, you know, because we're trying to, you know, solve the COVID crisis, so nobody's figuring this out. But nobody's figured out exactly how this chemistry works. But we know yeah. it does. Definitely. You think it might be like hormones or I don't know. It's so weird. Well, yeah, hormones. I'm not, I'm not much of a biology guy. I, I, I started out like most Jewish boys. I started out pre-med in college, but by the second term, I was into something else. Uh, so oh, I'm not really good on bio, but I'm guessing that 
hormones may be a way to uh, express it, to biologically express it. But actually, okay. not the chemical breakdown, you know, uh, yeah, I, yeah, clearly hormones. Yeah, Smell, that's good. aroma. Well, right, right. No, the, the attraction, which is inevitable, yeah. it just happens and you can't explain it. I totally get it. Uh, so you've been married for a long time. Um, I've, I'm, I'm an old guy and I've been married <laughs> since four years after college. Oh my and you God. Know what, wow. Yeah. And one of the things that worked so well for my wife and I, I don't know how, how to export this, but we got married uh, to give you a, a sense of how freaking old I am. We got married at the height of Vietnam. And I mean oh. the height of Vietnam. I raised what? my hand in the draft that Muhammad Ali refused to go in. Wow. I'd been married for 60 days and they didn't care that you were married. They just took oh. your ass and shipped it. Oh. Uh, and we had this incredible luck. First of all, there was the crucible. Oh shit, now Barney's gonna die, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought as well. Uh, and then I got lucky and a little bit smart and I wound up, because I was drafted right off Madison Avenue, I wound up being pulled out of advanced infantry training and sent to uh, the Fort Gordon, Georgia um, headquarters, garrison headquarters, and asked if I could do uh, command control con commercials for their closed circuit TV. So I did that for a little while. So my wife and I got to live in Georgia, which was a complete new experience for us. And then when a levy came down for Germany and my commanding officer said, get on this levy, it'll reduce your chances of going to where the action is. I wound up a tanker in Germany. So my wife and I play, spend our first two, two years either in Port Gordon, Georgia or Germany or traveling around Europe for a year. So this kind of, this kind of fused us together in a very unique way. So my, my advice to anybody, if, if, you can't re, if you can't replicate that, do something else. Get married and go somewhere. Get married and become a backpacker in Iceland. Just go somewhere <laughs> yeah. where the crucible fuses you together. Just to, don't do the same old, same old. And now he's sitting on the couch and he's scratching his ass. <laughs> scratching, your ass scratching your ass in Paris is way different than scratching your ass on the couch. Yes, true, true. So you're saying that to keep that vibe going or that chemistry going, just do something fun that will actually bond you even more than yeah. if you just were sitting. Okay, so that's that's the advice. So for us that don't have that experience, we can just do something fun and like, I don't do know, jump off a plane. Don't, 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 don't make the marriage the only change in your life. Yeah. You add okay, something good. to it that, that puts you in a place where you're essentially back to back against the world. Yeah. So I remember that once we were at Starbucks and we were talking and I was talking about somebody that I liked and you said, you know, marry somebody that you're friends with. And yeah. because eventually that's all that's left. And that yes. stuck with me because I listened to you, believe it or not. I listened oh, to you. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> right? No pressure. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that stuck with me. So you feel like right now after all these years of marriage, the friendship is like the most important thing Oh, that completely. you have and, yeah completely. and that's what doesn't have you or her leave the marriage it's like your right. guys are in for the rest of your life right you, you look you, you you know that I'm, I'm i'm a hopeless flirt and a harmless or a dirty yeah. old man yes you are uh, and, uh, yeah but but uh, these are things we overlook my wife's a flirt too she but, is right yeah. but we're friends yeah. and, and that's it how does that work? Okay, because I'm curious about that. Uh, some guys are jealous. So do you think that flirting with other people, not making it a reality, but just flirting makes your marriage better? Uh, no. Uh, well, yes, yes and no. At the beginning, okay. it's, 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 at the beginning, it's a trial because you're still feeling each other out. Um, we... Um, when we were bumming around Europe, um, I can I can pinpoint the moment where jealousy stopped being an, an issue. This is like three years after we're we're married. Uh, I put in my time in the service. She she was lucky 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 enough to get a job uh, as a teacher in the service schools, teaching American uh, uh, soldiers kids. Uh, and then when we separated, 
we had a little bit of cash. I still had money from um, Madison Avenue, but I was freelancing uh, from Europe, you know, sending stuff back and forth in those days by mail. Um, but so I got a little cash. So we were trapped bumming around Europe and we wound up in a, in a campground called Poggio Romano. It was on one of the hills of Rome. And we had, we had tricked out an old uh, DKW station wagon. Um, car aficionados will know what a Deutsche Kampfwagen is. Uh, and we were living in it. So we're, we're in this, um, we're in this, um, in, in this campground. And there's these two really handsome guys, like a pad over. And they're drinking. They're drinking grappa, you know, that very alcoholic uh, Italian brandy, yeah. I guess it is. And it, it turns out, long story short, that one of them is a footballer from Arsenal, and the other was his manager. And they were buff characters. Now, I, right out of the army, I was pretty buff too, but I was little and buff. These guys were big and buff. Little and buff. And we we wound up well because army training. We we, had, we wound up drinking with them in outside their tent talking about art, or at least my wife was talking about art. My wife is a, an intellectual. She now has a PhD. So she would say, you, have you seen this? And they go, no. And, or have you seen that? And they go, no. And she said, well, you've seen this. It's right down the hill. And they'd say, no. So I said, what are you guys doing here? And they both went like this. They just wanted to go someplace else to drink, someplace that wasn't wherever the hell Arsenal is. But the truth yeah. is they wanted to fuck my wife. Oh, oh my God. Okay. And, and when I realized, when I realized that I kind of relaxed back into it and said, okay, one of two things is going to happen. Either something like, something like sex is going to happen and I'm going to be involved in it or <laughs> nothing like sex is going to happen. And I'm going to be really comfortable from now on and nothing like sex happened. And I've been really comfortable from then on. Oh, good. I'm glad. That, that would have been, yeah, they would have changed a lot of things, the dynamic. Yeah, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not saying that you have to erect things like going to Europe. Maybe we're going to get into a group sex thing with some British footballers. Um, what I'm saying is these things happen to everybody all the yeah. time. You all have to time. notice. Yeah, you have to notice that they're happening. They happen Absolutely. in different ways. And you just have to keep your eyes and ears open and notice that something is going on now. And every, every test is a lesson. John Leguizamo's True. great line. In life, first you get the test, then you get the lesson. Then you get the lesson, right. But exactly. you just have to be open to the fact that you're being tested all the time. Absolutely. And I would love to talk about our project. We wrote oh, two projects, actually, right? Yes. We wrote a feature film called Everybody Loves Carmen, which was your idea. And then we wrote another one called Finding Grace based on my love life. And I want you to tell oh. the story of how that okay. all came about. Okay, well, so here's what happened from my point of view, and Grace may not tell me that's completely different. But <laughs> okay. um, so I had this idea to, to write a, a rom-com set in a, a, a threadbare production of the opera Carmen. Uh, I'm, I like opera. I go to the opera. I'm not an opera buff, but I'm sort of uniquely situated to know that everybody does like Carmen. There are three arias in common that everybody knows, whether they know they're from Carmen or not. Yeah. So I, I said it in, in there, and, and I wanted it to be initially Spanish. I wanted to set it in Sevilla, which is where Carmen originally debuted. So when I met Grace, and she was so funny, and she was Spanish, although from Buenos Aires, not from well, Sevilla. Yeah. Let's uh, I said, let's do it. She said, let's set it in Buenos Aires. I said, perfect, because the whole joke here is these, these old-time opera guys need to get back to the, to the big circuit. So we started working on it. And like a lot of writers around Hollywood, we, our, our, our shop was various uh, coffee shops. Uh, that was our office. So at one particular coffee shop, I forget where, where it was, uh, I would sit there, Grace, who, who normally either came in early or late, but never on time, um, <laughs> would start, I'd have to do 20 minutes of listening to her latest love disaster. <laughs> Before we could get to the it was like a warm up, like you're doing warm up for a show. And uh, and finally, about four or five times in, I said to her, "You know, these stories that you tell me are a show." Uh, and then so we came up with Finding Grace, which then Grace ran with and uh, did a, a sort of a semi autobiographical um, Latinx flea bag kind of thing. And that's, 
And both of these things are making the rounds now. One of them is with a, uh, a Spanish producer who's got it with a, with an Argentinian uh, director uh, awesome. who recently did a movie that I like quite a bit, did it in Spanish, but wants to do something in English in Buenos Aires. So that might be really cool. Yes. Uh, although I still look forward to going back to Spain. I did a movie called Guernica, uh, Guernica if you're a Latin, uh, in Spain, and I like to go back, it was great. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about that movie? Because that movie was a, like a not a huge budget, but it was a big budget movie, and it was a co production. Yeah, it was a right? sizable. It, it went out the door at the end of the day at about seven million USD. Um, it was, um, it was uh, like everything else. It was, uh, it was. I, I, there was something I wanted to do that I couldn't do, and this became the next best thing. I have always wanted to do. And by the way, there's a movie coming out eventually from the guy who did The Wire something about the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. The Abraham Lincoln, actually the Abraham Lincoln Battalion. The Abraham Lincoln Battalion of the International Brigades was a complete volunteer uh, of armed force that fought on the side of the good guys, the leftists, in the Spanish Civil War in the mid-30s. Um, my mother always used to kid my father that she married him on the rebound from a, 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 an American brigadier who died in the Spanish Civil War. So I always wanted to do their story. They're fascinating people. Uh, who decided to, they wanted to fight fascism. Mm -hmm. fa it, the Spanish Civil War was the first, the first blush of, of, of military fascism in Europe. Uh, and I, I was giving a talk to um, uh, Latin American and Spanish uh, filmmakers at, at AFM one year, and they were all pitching me stuff. And I said, well, hey, here's an idea. Let me pitch you something. And I pitched them this idea. Uh, and everybody wanted to work with me because I, I had done some nature stuff. And uh, we just couldn't get, we couldn't, we couldn't get the, the, the Civil War thing done. And, and finally, uh, the, the Spanish guy that I was working with, Carlos Clavillo, wonderful screenwriter, and a, and a humorist like yourself, um, said, what about, what, what about a story about the bombing of, of Guernica? And I said, cool. And I whipped out a story, you know me, I whipped out a story in a half a day. Right. Uh, yeah, and right. it was basically Titanic. It was basically two uh, inimical people fall in love and bam, here come the bombs. So uh, that was that it was a seven million dollar thing. Uh, I have been trying to get do another European independent, but I now realize how lucky I was putting this thing together. Everything I did was the right thing, and it was Amazing. it was strictly beginner's luck. So you're an inventor, really. You're a very you're like a genius inventor, uh, but you're also really good. Really Go good at structuring um, whatever it's a, a movie or a show. You always are like really good at structuring. What is your creative process? How do you come up first of all with the idea, and second of all, uh, the structure? Like, you do you yes and it, or do you have a structure already in your head of the movie or the pilot? How how is your creative process? Oh, okay. Every, everybody listening, if there is anybody listening anymore. There is no, there is a, uh, there's a lot of people, yes. Good. Uh, everybody listening has come, come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I come from Madison Avenue, right out of college, doing ads, creative director. So I know that I can only move forward if I can see the single unifying graphic that tells the story. For instance, a movie poster. In fact, I did the movie poster for MASH. Mm -hmm the uh, butt crack and the high heels and stuff like that. Uh, so I, I need to know, first of all, that I can see the poster. Uh, I can see the poster to Carmen and find the grace. Uh, then I moved that, I thought that was a silly thing to do for a living. I had won a couple of awards and I thought, geez, I want, uh, and I became a journalist. So going around the world, talking to a lot of different people, I was very much a generalist. I, I didn't have a specific thing to do. Uh, I, you get a sense of how people talk, how they walk, how they interface. And then you become a filmmaker and you use both those things. So for instance, uh, what I was talking about with, with Guernica, you see how the creative process happened. I wanted to do something about something. I couldn't do it. But as soon as I thought of Guernica and the, the Picasso painting, I could see the single unifying graphic. And in fact, we used a lot of the details from that painting, but turned them into live footage. You know, the burning burrow and stuff like that, and the shaking light over him. So I do that. And then then comes the structure part, because I'm basically, I'm a storyteller. 
And one of the things I've learned about uh, telling a story, both in 30 seconds on a TV spot and in a newspaper article and in a movie, is that there need to be discernible curtains that draw you through the, the story. Because uh, if you're just telling a long story, a, long, a short story can sound very long. But if there are moments where you think, okay, what happens next? Okay, what happens next? Not cliffhangers, but, but this, this, this leading people into the next thing. Uh, I, I don't care what the structure is. It could be a two-act uh, uh, thing. Uh, for instance, horror movies. Uh, every horror movie I've ever written was two acts. What the hell is it? How the hell do we get rid of it? Just two acts. You try to stick right. a third act in the middle, everybody looks at their watches. Uh, or you can write like Shakespeare in five acts. Or you could write like a TV movie in nine acts. It doesn't matter the amount of acts. It matters the, the, the audience sensibility of thinking, oh, I got that. Now what? So each, each question is answered with another question. It's almost a Socratic process. So <laughs> structure is very important to me. Uh, the writing itself, a lot less important. I gave up being the great American novelist a long time ago. And in college, I was a poet. I, I, I don't really do that. I, I, I'm a, for better or worse, I'm a professional writer. Right. I write things that people will look at and say, well, let's put some money in it. Um, so I mean, it's good and it's not so good, but it's, it's what it is. And so to me, I, I'm a storyteller. I find a story to tell and I figure out how to structure it so that people will listen to it all the way to the end. Yeah, well, uh, we're going to close on a couple. I want to close on a couple of questions. Uh, one is, what advice do you have uh, to young writers um, as far as the business and writing itself? And then I'm going to ask you a love question, but let's answer that uh -oh. first. <laughs> OK, so as far as writers go, uh, take, a, take a guess about how many times I've been asked that question. Uh, a million and a half, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> yes, a, a million and a half. I, I, I'm going to carry cards that say, I uh, just have one word on it. And it's, the word would be right. That's all you can right. do. The only, thing you, yeah. the only thing you can control is what you do with the page. Uh, I happen to be an accomplished, and I wish I was an even better accomplished player of the game. I can game a lot of the writing systems. That's why I've been able to do so many different kinds of writing. Uh, yes, I am a man of letters. I can do pretty much anything that has to do with, with a QWERTY. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's really about writing. You have to write with, with people come to me all the time and say, I have a great horror story. People tell me that all the time because of Friday the 13th. They do, yeah. Uh, and I say, well, can you write it in one page? And they can't write it in one page. They can't. If you can't write it in one page, you're just meandering. This person has yeah. big breasts. This person uh, has a snaggle tooth. It, that's all bullshit. Uh, am, I, yeah. ooh, am I allowed to say bullshit? Bull crap. Well, that's all bull crap. Already, so we're good. <laughs> that's true. Sorry about that. You uh, across the boundary a while ago, so we're good. Right, sorry about that. So, uh, so people. yeah, I, th I thought it was on HBO. Um, no, it's fine. It's totally cool. It's really oh, the only goodness. thing you can do is write. I, you know, if, yeah. if you, you know, Andy Warhol said a great thing about his art, which was called into question early and often, and is still called into question. He says, "Never worry about whether your art is good enough. Other people will tell you whether it's good enough." And what I they like mean that. is not good enough on some ephemeral metaphysical scale, but good enough to buy. Right. Just do your art, see what happens. I love it. That's great advice. Uh, and also I would love some advice for us uh, single people, <laughs> single ladies. <laughs> uh, what advice do you have uh, for, for somebody like me whose lab life tends to be a little complicated? Whoa. Like so many women out there. There are so many women. There are also so many men. And, and these days you might like a woman. You know, it, it's, it's all good now. Um, oh, gee, you know, any advice that I would give you that would carry any weight at all, you, you would have to be living in the 60s because that's the last time I was really part of this, this scene. <laughs> You're uh, part of the culture, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but, but really what, I, what I've said so far is, you know, there's, I, there's another, another guy I like to quote, and that's... Um, Oh gosh, uh, Lord, um, blah, 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 blah. The, uh, Nelson, uh, Admiral Nelson, uh, in, in, in Piccadilly Square, the, the Tra Trafalgar Circle, there's a statue to him. He, he defeated a large Spanish force and he, he, he and, and there were more Spanish boats than there were men in your life. There were a lot of Spanish boats. And he, he had a meeting aboard his flagship 
which name I forget. And he told the commanders of his various ships, his various warships, he said, look, I have no battle plan. The English sailor is superior to the Spanish sailor. No offense, Spaniards. Pull your ship up alongside a Spanish ship and sink it. This is how life ought to be run. Uh, you pull yourself up next to the thing you want to sink and sink it. If you want to, if you want to uh, uh, find love, pull yourself up next to the kind of guys who you want to find love with, and then you'll either win or lose. Yeah. There's, there's no, there's no way to do it. If we had more time, I'd tell you the story about the, um, the, um, the prostitute uh, Julia Chavez Taylor, who was. Um, <laughs> We can leave that for the next time. Okay. Bro, but, but, her, stories. <laughs> but no, no, her, her advice on how to attract men was to juggle ice cubes in your mouth at the bar. Oh. And I said, you know, what? that may work if you're paying for it, but <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> That's uh, great. No, I, had done, I had done a story about her. Um, she, she, had, she was the CIA prostitute for uh, Arkady Shevchenko, a, a Russian defector. So they oh, would torture wow. him and then turn him over to Judy and torture him and turn him over to Judy. I have no advice on love. It's kind no of No advice. Fun. Okay. And on that note, uh, thank you so much for being Pleasure. on the First Love, the Green Room Edition. I love talking to you, whether it's here or at Starbucks. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You're full of stories and advice and wisdom. And I love you so much. You're amazing. And you've been an incredible mentor and friend. And I appreciate you very much. This has been great. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So thank you for everybody that tuned in and commented and I'll see you next time.